Welcome back to the Constitution Line by Line. I'm Senator Mike Lee. Today we'll be talking about Article 1, Section 8 by looking specifically at Clauses 11 through 16, which address the military powers granted to Congress. The text gives Congress the power, quote, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections and repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. When drafting the Constitution, the framers felt it was important that the power to wage war not rest in the hands of a single individual, like a king, as under the English system. The consequences of warfare were simply too great to be left up to the whims of a monarch. And so it was decided that a democratic process must, at least in part, govern the waging of war. In an early draft of this section, Clause 11 gave Congress the power to make war rather than simply declare it. This was changed as it was thought that the consent of both the President and the two houses of Congress should be necessary before going to war, with Congress issuing the declaration and the President serving as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. There are a couple of terms in these clauses that we may not immediately understand today, or terms that have at least lost their prominence and fallen out of common usage over time. For example, the reference to letters of mark and reprisal referred to a power of Congress to commission privateers, that is, private citizens charged with fighting decentralized threats to the Republic, uh, like piracy on the high seas. And piracy on the high seas would be fought, essentially, with individuals commissioned to engage in piracy on the high seas in the name of the United States. Although this power remains in the text of the Constitution, letters of mark and reprisal haven't been issued for a long time, and some have even argued that they were prohibited by a Paris Declaration in 1856, to which the United States uh, signed on as a party. Still, that doesn't mean that you can read out a power of Congress uh, simply by international agreement. Uh, one could argue, I think persuasively, that unless or until the Constitution is amended, Congress has that power, regardless of what uh, some might read into an international agreement. In any event, there has been talk of reviving the power uh, to deal with a variety of modern threats. In the wake of the September 11th attacks in 2001, the possibility of using letters of mark and reprisal to combat the threat of radical Islamic terrorism was discussed, uh, although it was ultimately rejected. And then again in 2009, Representative Ron Paul introduced legislation to issue letters of mark and reprisal against the then current scourge of Somalian piracy. This proposal was there again rejected, and most recently it's been suggested that letters of mark could be employed to fight online piracy or cyber attacks. As of yet, no move has been taken to act on these suggestions, but the power remains in the Constitution. In clauses 15 and 16, the Constitution grants Congress the power to organize, arm, and call forth the militia for a variety of purposes. At the time of the founding, the militia referred to soldiers maintained by the individual states which could be brought under federal authority as needed. Under the National Defense Act of 1916, the term militia was redefined to mean all able-bodied men between the ages of 18 and 45 who were citizens of the United States, 
To that extent, some have argued that the concept of state militias has become archaic, although the concept of state militias still lives on in National Guards. The National Guards are run by the states, with their officers being selected by the states, typically the governor, and the National Guard of each state can be mobilized into federal action when directed to do so uh, under these provisions by the President of the United States. The fact that the ability to declare war is vested in the Congress and not the presidency has led to some controversies about what constitutes a legitimate use of military force. To date, only five wars have been officially declared by Congress. The War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, and the First and Second World Wars. During the Civil War, the Supreme Court upheld President Lincoln's blockade of the southern ports without congressional approval, arguing that the country was already in a state of war and that no declaration was needed. In other words, the court decided that if the nation is under attack, then the president may respond without the express authorization of Congress. Beginning with the Korean War, every military conflict involving the United States has lacked a congressional declaration of war as such. In most cases, Congress instead has passed a bill authorizing the use of military force for a specific time and circumstance. Occasionally, this practice has been challenged as somehow unconstitutional and uh, as amounting to an abuse of executive authority. For example, in Dellums versus Bush, 54 members of Congress sued then-President George Herbert Walker Bush, seeking to prevent his military engagement in Iraq without a congressional declaration of war. The District Court for the District of Columbia, however, ruled in favor of President Bush, and the Supreme Court always reluctant to get involved in political power struggles, has declined to issue a ruling on the War Powers Clause. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Constitution Line by Line. In the next episode, we'll finish talking about Article 1, Section 8, with a discussion of the Necessary and Proper Clause. Remember to subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications. I'll see you here again next time.